and in archaeology that the Babylonian system, the Babylonian government at this time, had great libraries. Not unlike our libraries today where they arrange books by subject, any subject matter, you could find a book on it, and you could check out those books for a period of time as well. But Nebuchadnezzar, very big on learning and on, and on knowledge, but unfortunately was lacking in wisdom and in the knowledge of knowing our Father. Although, we'll find in this book of Daniel, by the time we get to, what is it, I believe the fourth chapter, fourth or fifth chapter, that Nebuchadnezzar actually will come to believe in God Almighty. Um, but again, let this be a, a let us recognize as we go from history and types to present day and future, that Nebuchadnezzar being a type of Antichrist, that uh, when the Antichrist comes, when Satan comes in that role, he also will be looking for certain people, for certain children. Uh, And he'll be looking for the best and the brightest and well-favored by God. In other words, he'll be looking for God's election. He'll be looking to try to convert those that know that he's the fake. He already will have, sadly enough, the rest of the world on his side, even a lot of well-meaning, good-intentioned, sincere Christians. And so he's going to come trying his best to convert those who are prepared to stand against him when that time comes. I do not think he'll be successful with a single one of them, But he's certainly going to try, and those who are God's elect, those who know the the times that we're in and the times that are coming and the events that will transpire and which Messiah, so to speak, shows up first, uh, those who know that the first one's a fake, that fake certainly knows who they are and uh, has them squarely in his sights. But you know something? No big deal. God will protect his own. Uh, Verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And again, this three-year period, a couple things here, this three-year period, we know originally that the tribulation of Antichrist, or the tribulation was set up to be a seven-year period, period of time, actually divided into two periods of three and a half years. So this three-year period is is somewhat relevant. We know also that Christ himself shortened the time of that tribulation for the sake of his elect. I believe he shortened it to only a five-month period, as given in Revelation chapter 9, the the period or the time of the locust, which uh, some would point to being a, a period of May through September. Uh, Likely true, but regardless, it's a five-month period of time. But also, here you have Nebuchadnezzar, and it's quite the socialist, uh, we'll-take-care-of-everything system, in a way, because here you have uh, state-run, state-provided education. Uh, No big deal with that, necessarily. Most of our education in this country, of course, is public Uh, although uh, with that we do have much indoctrination, but state-run education and even state-provided food, taking care of your every need. Uh, Something else that Satan, of course, will offer to do, he'll do whatever it takes to get you on his side and to buy your very soul when it comes down to it. But uh, also, here we have food, of course, being provided by Nebuchadnezzar, by that system, But we have to look at this in a spiritual sense, too. Uh, Satan, Antichrist, uh, what is the food that a Christian, or and really anybody, the spiritual food that anyone should want to take in and subsist on and and have as sustenance, sustenance, uh, food from this word of God, uh, the bread of life, being a Christ word. And as well, the living water also being from Christ and from this word of God. Uh, That's where you're fed. That's where you mature. That's where you grow up. Uh, That's where, again, you strengthen yourself. The food that Antichrist 
will provide at that time is poisonous, is toxic, is spiritual junk food, and I can guarantee you that you'll want nothing to do with that whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I, I thought of this, and again, this was in the original show. Um, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 29. Uh, I've got about 20, 24 minutes here. I'm trying to move somewhat as quickly as I can. But Isaiah chapter 29, um, some of this, um, well, I'll start with verse 1 and just try to move as quickly as possible. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt, and ye, year to year, let them kill sacrifices. The city where David dwelt, of course, is Jerusalem, so that's the location that we're referring to at this time, that, that is referred to in Isaiah 29. Verse 2, Yet I will distress Ariel, Jerusalem, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. Uh, now, why would there be heaviness and sorrow? Because of who's set up there proclaiming himself to be God. Because of who's set up there proclaiming himself to be Jesus Christ. And is nothing but a fake. Verse 3, And I will camp against thee round about, and will lay siege against thee with a mount, and I will raise forts against thee. When those armies encompass Jerusalem, we know that that's close to the time of the end. And here you have God saying that he's going to allow it to happen, and he's even going to bring them against Jerusalem at that time. Verse 4, And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar or an evil spirit. Out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Now, this should automatically draw your mind back to Genesis chapter 3, where Satan, in that role as the serpent, had that sentence passed down upon him, that he would uh, crawl upon his belly and eat dust, uh, which is a, a sentence or a statement of degradation and of shame. And, and so it is, and that lets you know, too, just who's going to be in Jerusalem at this time. It's not going to be some man some flesh man, it's not even going to be a, a man possessed by Satan, as some would say, but it will be Satan himself uh, playing that role of spurious Messiah. Verse 5, Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. Yea, it shall be in an instant suddenly. And so it is when we get to the second chapter of Daniel, when Christ returns, he destroys that one world system immediately. Just like that. And, and it will be gone forever. Though Satan will have a period of time to deceive after 1,000 years, that system will be done away with. Verse 6, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noises with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. A again, that system... And those who uh, brought it about, although they will have an opportunity, should they so choose, to straighten up during the millennium, as there will be a time of teaching and of correcting. Uh, but God will use the natural elements to put an end to the two uh, battles of Armageddon and Haman Gog. And uh, then his... Again, we'll have the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ to, to enjoy. Verse 7, And the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munition, and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. Verse 8, specifically why I came here, speaking of food now, It shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh. But he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. And so it will be that those who unfortunately take in and partake of that spiritual food of Antichrist during that time. He'll keep shoveling it out as a veritable spiritual buffet and you can eat and eat and eat and you can drink and drink and drink but do you know something your soul will never have peace your soul will never be fulfilled and you'll always continue to be hungry this is why 
It was written in Amos chapter 8, and speaking of the end time famine, verse 11, it's not a famine for bread or water, but a famine for hearing the true word of God. And, and so it is that even now, we're starting to see that famine take place, and we're starting to see that apostasy uh, take place, in which you have churches and uh, Christians who would say, uh, again, just as an example now, that that which God has declared to be an abomination and an unnatural perversion is, is okay, that, that meaning homosexuality, gay marriage, uh, marrying them in our churches, uh, appointing them as pastors, as bishops, as deacons, what have you. And uh, also, again, going back to this election, where we had, I think it was 72% of evangelicals, self, self-styled, self-professed evangelicals, confessed Christians who said that uh, the moral failings or the uh, immorality or the, the personal sins, if you will, of a candidate did not matter when it came to them being elected president, that they believe that what a person has done in their personal life will have no effect on uh, their time in office. Well, not only does that run afoul of certainly what the founding fathers in this country believed, but it should run afoul of common sense that if a person, whomever it may be, is dishonest, or cheat someone in their business dealings or finances or personal affairs, uh, or if a person is uh, unfaithful in their marriage, then it not only runs afoul of what the Founding Fathers believed, but it should run afoul of common sense to say that that person would be totally faithful and uh, totally moral in their time in office. But such it, so it is, and so it is the times that we're living in, it would seem. Uh, getting back to the book of uh, Daniel, and uh, we're at verse 6 now. Now, among these were of the children of Judah. Uh, among these children picked out by Nebuchadnezzar and by uh, old horse face, Ashpenaz here, his master prince of the eunuchs. Now, among these were the children of Judah. Those children being Daniel, God is judge, Hananiah, Yah is gracious, Mishael, who is as El, and Azariah, meaning helped of Yah, or Yah has helped. Uh, so, some pretty good names here. They're going to be given different names. Verse 7, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, which means translates as, O Bel, protect his life, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, uh, command of Aku, the moon god, and to Mishael of Meshach, meaning who is as Aku, again that moon god, and to Azariah of Abednego, servant or worshiper of Nego. And uh, so their names were changed. These are the names that most of us refer to them as. Not their given names. uh, No big deal necessarily, but certainly uh, their given Hebrew names. uh, Quite beautiful. But uh, anyway, most people today, of course, refer them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, But anyway, verse 8, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So here we have Daniel taking a stand. And again, it will be up to everyone of God's election and everyone who recognizes uh, Satan as the fake that he is to take that same stand, not to partake of that spiritual food, Daniel, as was written here in a companion Bible by E.W. Bollinger, uh, Daniel probably did not want to eat the king's meat for a couple of reasons. Number one, it likely wasn't properly bled. And during that time in particular, you want to bleed an animal even today, of course, but during that time with no real method of, uh, of, of freezing or preserving meats like we have today, an animal that wasn't properly bled would indeed spoil rather quickly. And it was likely animals and meats that were sacrificed unto idols as well. And uh